Good afternoon, everyone. The topic for this week is basically to talk about or look into how global warming is actually, or the knowledge we have on how global warming is affecting the performance of different animal species. But first of all, we should start with some introductory concepts into how temperature affects physiological prox uh, processes. And essentially, if we take a look into the basic problems that we are facing on our Earth, that of course can be actually quantified in terms of, you have here, ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, in this case you have the nitrogen cycle or the phosphorus cycle, a global freshwater use, change in land use, biodiversity loss, atmospheric aerosol loading, chemical pollution, finally climate change. Basically, when these quantifications are done, it's very clear that some of these problems are more accentuated than others. And the one that we want to focus is on this climate change, in which basically the safe operating spa space defined for each one of these issues is defined in green here, and in red is basically where we are at the moment. Of course, you can see that both the pro problems with nitrogen and biodiversity loss are much larger, but nevertheless, climate change is an issue that has important consequences, and you read these on the news uh, on a daily basis. So this is not something that is not new to you. Uh, but interestingly enough, there are some historical uh, archives that basically tell us that this is really not a new problem. This is something that... Uh, already as Vante Arrhenius in the 19th century had already posed or had already thought about, he said he wrote another side of the question that has long attracted the attention of physicists, long attracted the attention of physicists already back in 1896, is this. Is the mean temperature of the ground in any way influenced by the presence of heat absorbing gases in the atmosphere? So the fact that we are producing CO2 and these levels of CO2 and other um, um, greenhouse gases, so-called greenhouse gases, has been an issue. And also August Kroc, the eminent scientist that I have cited uh, several times in this course already, doing measurements in Greenland, measurements back down, down this is published in 1904, also also was concerned about this and he wrote before leaving this subject as the paper he was writing it will be necessary to add some words concerning the influence of the climate on the state of equilibrium and also the possible interaction between the atmospheric carbonic acid and the climate so this this has been a long problem but of course it's been identified the problem is what do we do with it you have a trend over the build-up of carbon dioxide over from 1955 to today, well, this data is to 2005, a much longer term record for temperature seen clearly indicating basically that temperature on Earth is rising uh, markedly. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to talk about this. This is not the topic of this course. We are not here to discuss global warming or climate change. We are here to talk about how these changes that we are ob obviously seeing actually have an effect in the physiology and the biology of animals. And to bring this to the basics, say, well, animals are usually qua um, classified either as conformers or as regulators. A conformer animal is that animal, but basically that allows the body temperature, the internal temperature, to be similar, close to the external temperature. These are the animals that we call ectotherms. These are animals that do not generate body heat, or if they do, it's too little to make an effect. And therefore, we see this curse that basically these animals allow their internal temperature to fluctuate with the environment. In the other extreme, basically, we have those that we call regulators, in which body temperature, internal temperature is constant, no matter what the external temperature is. These are two extremes of a continuum. And of course, we would find very few animals that behave like this and very few animals that behave like this. Because within some or at some extreme temperatures, the uh, regulator would always have problems. And of course, not 
even ectotherms do not always allow the body temperature to be matched by the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically the picture we have, that within a certain range in the um, environmental conditions, animals become regulators, but sometimes, or in this case, when regulation is no longer possible, the animal becomes a conformer. This is a curve showing what happens with oxygen. So if the levels of oxygen are within a certain range here, no units, no need to mention, the animal regulates and basically tries to keep the rate, in this case, of oxygen consumption, how much oxygen is used, is constant. But below a certain level, when the animal no longer can extract enough oxygen, it can no longer regulate and becomes a conformer. So don't look at this in the sense of these extreme pictures, because they are usually extreme, but basically consider that animals can change or should, will change the strategy based on which conditions they are found. This is in tune with a discussion we have already had in this course about the concepts of acclimatization, acclimation, and adaptation. And I think, yet again, I'm going to repeat this because they are important concepts in understanding how animals basically adjust themselves to the environment. We have called acclimatization that process, that physiological, biochemical, or anatomical change in which an animal deals or ch the animal makes changes to adjust itself to the new environmental conditions. Acclimation is referring to something relatively similar, very similar, but usually we use the term acclimation when we are talking about laboratory conditions. Animals exposed to some laboratory conditions in which we usually don't change many parameters, but we change temperature, we change oxygen, we change humidity, for example. Finally, we have the concept of adaptation. And adaptation here, I define it as an evolutionary process commonly attributed to natural selection by which a species gradually changes to better fit its natural environment. We have discussed this before, and I'm going to present yet another example of it here. Mm -hmm. Again, in the same line, this is a table from your textbook in which it talks about these five time frames in which physiology changes, from acute changes all the way to evolutionary changes, but also considering that these changes can happen through development, that means that depending on the age of the animals, or also associated with periodic clocks. Mm -hmm. And it's important when we try to understand physiology to, to understand what is it that it's happening? What is it that the changes we see are actually reflecting? Are they, are they reflecting an acclimatization process to acute changes? Are they reflecting something that is much more, much longer term? It's a, a characteristic, it's a feature of the population because there's been, a there's been an evolutionary change. Let me repeat yet again this example that I've talked about in relation with phenotypic plasticity. This example has to do with crucian carb gills. The gills is the uh, oxygen uptake organ or of a fish. They look pretty much like this, in which you have the filaments and therefore the lamella. And this lamella increase surface area in order to allow the exchange of water, uh, in order that the exchange of oxygen from the water into the blood. Remember yet again, that's part of the basic physiology, that this flow, the flow of water and the flow of blood, occur in counter current direction. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens in this fish, in the crucian carp, is that in situation of normoxia, this gill filament shows very few expansions, very few lamella. But as the animal is put in, in hypoxia, that means lower oxygen in the water, these lamella get larger and larger. This is by 14 days, you see a properly developed lamella. And when these animals are returned to normal oxygenation conditions, basically these are lost again. This is a clear example of a process of phenotypic plasticity. This animal has the ability to recruit, to produce this rec lamella recruitment, increase the surface area of the gills in order to obtain more oxygen in situations when there is little oxygen in the water. But when the conditions of oxygen in the water are improved, go better, the animal basically down decreases the size of the lamella. We now know that it's important to do this. This is a question you could have, you could pose, because why is this better in normoxic conditions than this? Essentially because keeping all the transporters 
keeping the, mem the, lam uh, the lamella extended this way basically increases also the surface area for loss of ions and water to the environment and vice versa. So basically there is a nice balance here in between oxygen uptake, the ability to take oxygen, you increase surface area, or when you do that, the loss of ions to the environment. So animals actually have to change plastically between these conditions. And then we go for a more longer term process, a process of adaptation. I don't know if you've heard the, the term esthenothermy. Esthenothermy as opposed to aerothermy. Esthenothermy, re, uh, uh, the, the name esthenothermy refers to the situation in which an animal is actually placed in temperature conditions that are fixed. And that are fixed today, are fixed tomorrow, were fixed yesterday and have been fixed for many, many, many thousands of years. This is the situation in Antarctica. In Antarctica, we know that this is the Antarctic continent, we know very well that something called the ACC, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the ACC, was established 17 to 35 million years ago. That defines a boundary that you see in these lines over which the ocean here has a fixed and a steady water temperature. This is because the currents circulating around Antarctica keep maintain the cold within this Antarctic circum, uh, circumpolar current. The conditions in Antarctica for the last several million years ago actually have been at minus 1.9 degrees centigrade. Just remember that water does not freeze at zero degrees if it contains salts. That's why it's possible to have liquid water in Antarctica at minus 1.9 degrees, because it's salty. What happens in this situation? In this situation, you have a clear prevalence of one family of fishes, the notothenioids. And in these notothenioid fishes, basically, that have actually adjusted to the conditions of the Antarctic uh, water temperature, uh, it, what, what's characteristic about this family basically is the acquisition of what we call the AFGPs, the, uh, the anti-freeze glycoproteins. AFGP stands for anti-freeze glycoprotein. Mm -hmm. Here you, you see some uh, notothenioids under the, the Antarctic ice. And what is it characteristic about these notothenioids? Well, what you see basically, they have been living in these conditions for many, many thousands of years. And if you actually go and take some species now and measure their thermal maxima, the maximal temperature at which they survive, what you see is that this, there is a nice relationship between the temperature, the higher the temperature, or the, temp the species that actually can su uh, survive at higher temperatures are those species that have actually an increased hematocrit in the blood. These are the species that have red blood cells. These are the species that are able to transport more oxygen in their blood. Versus the kyanictid fishes, in which they have basically no red blood cells, and because of that, they tolerate much lower temperatures. You may ask, well, how do you assess the maximal temperature a fish can take? It's basically you put it in a gradient with uh, warming water, that's warming at slowly at uh, higher temperatures, and basically when the fish lose the writing reflexes, that's taken as the maximal thermal temperature. The, the animals are not killed simply when the animal lose orientation and balance, that's taken as the maximal uh, temperature in this case. And that then brings for this clearly demonstrated adaptation that the anti-freeze anti glycoproteins provide Antarctic fishes. Uh, this, actually, this data is from a recent paper, relatively recent paper, that uh, makes the story a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to make the story more complicated for you. But basically what we see is that the notothenioids, the fish that we now find in Antarctica, Essentially, we claim that there is about 101 species in Antarctica. 
Out of these, 100 are notothenioids. There is only one species of fish that is not a not notothenioid. Why have notothenioids basically survived and thrived in Antarctic conditions and not other families of fishes? Essentially because it seems that the key he thing here was the acquisition of the AFGP gene during the time when the circumpolar and, or the Antarctic circumpolar current was established. Going back here, in a situation in which DC had nothing in particular, over 17 to 35 million years ago, this starts being established and water gets colder. The animals that are actually come up with a evolutionary novelty, the acquisition of the AFGP protein, the antifreeze anti, anti glycoprotein, are able to thrive and make it. And that's what you see here. Basically, it, this is the period in which water in Antarctica gets colder in the Oligocene in association with the establishment of the ACC. Notice that here you have the first radiation of notothenioid groups, the ones in blue. What this paper contributes is basically demonstrate that this happened several times within the same family of notothenioids. But that's nothing that we are going to talk about. Essentially, within this list of notothenioids, you see that all species, almost all species, actually have this uh, Antarctic uh, uh, antifreeze glycoprotein, except for the ones in black here. These ones don't show the antifreeze glycoprotein, uh, but, uh, but the other ones do. This is one of the most accepted examples of an adaptation in an evolutionary sense. It was the acquisition of this AFGP gene that allowed these species to tolerate and survive and succeed and thrive in the Antarctic conditions of minus, minus 1.9 degrees. And that's it for this, uh, for this first part of the lecture. Now I'll take some questions. Thank you.